Okay, so um, I'm going to be lecturing out of the first chapter here in the Sandel book. Okay, and I want to use the Sandel book as an occasion for exploring the moral strengths and weaknesses of market mechanisms. Here in the West and in the United States especially, we have capitalist markets as the primary way in which we allocate funding around the society and in which we uh, allocate buying and selling decisions. And I want to use Sandel's exploration of what he calls jumping the queue in this first chapter of his text as an opportunity for exploring the moral strengths and weaknesses of markets. Okay, and uh, you guys can see this is kind of an introduction to the text, too. Uh, please do uh, jump in on the reading. I'm going to be sending out a send out reading schedule. It's going to be slightly revised because we've got these group presentation classes that um, that are now not going to be taking place. Uh, those prior to the semester, I planned for people to be presenting their group presentations today and Wednesday, but that's not going to happen. So, um, so I'm going to send out a revised reading schedule for that. Okay, but um, let's use the jumping the key chapter to explore the moral strengths and weaknesses of markets. And I want to just read bits and pieces from this chapter so we're all on the same page and know what he's talking about. Sandel is interested in the ways in which market reasoning has uh, expanded into the more general non-market aspects of the culture over the last few years. And it's been a trend that's been going on for many decades, but it's accelerated in the last several years. And here's some examples of the trend. Okay, um, here's the quote. Long lines at airport security checkpoints. This is his first example, airport security checkpoints. Long lines at airport security checkpoints make, make air travel an ordeal, but not everyone has to wait in the serpentine queues. Those who buy first class or business class tickets can use priority lanes that take them to the front of the line for screening. British Airways calls it fast track, a service that also lets high paying passengers jump the queue at passport and immigration control. Okay, so this is an example of a market-based solution to enable people who are willing to pay to move quickly through airport security lines. They are trading money for time. Okay, so one example that Sandel cites is airport security. None of us likes to wait in airport security lines. They can be really long. If you're willing to pay, increasingly airports are allowing people to fast track through that uh, inconvenient process. Okay, here's another example that he cites. Fast track, the fast track trend can also be seen on freeways across the United States. Increasingly, commuters can buy their way out of bumper to bumper traffic and into a fast moving express lane. Okay, here in Houston, you buy a pass and it enables you, in theory at least, to get around the traffic. I'm not sure it's always true in practice. Okay, but the idea is that the carpool lane or the express lane uh, enable some who are willing to pay to um, trade time for money and to move faster through the lane and to use a market-based solution to move faster across the highway. Okay, here's another one. I like this example. This is his third example. Even when you're not allowed to buy your way to the head of the line, you can sometimes hire someone else to queue up on your behalf. Each summer, New York City's public theater puts on free outdoor Shakespeare performances in Central Park. Tickets for the evening performances are made available at 1 p.m. and the line forms hours in advance. Many New Yorkers were eager to see this, the play, but didn't have time to stand in line. As the New York Daily News reported, this predicament gave rise to a cottage industry, people offering to wait in line to secure tickets for those willing to pay for the convenience. The line standers advertised their services on Craigslist and other, other websites in exchange for queuing up and enduring the wait, they were able to charge their busy clients as much as $125 per ticket for the free performances. Okay, so Shakespeare lines are another example of capitalist markets at work. Some people are willing to queue up on behalf of others. Others pay them and basically trade again time for money so that those who have busy office jobs don't have to spend time in line waiting for free Shakespeare tickets. Okay, here's one more example along these lines. Actually, two more. 
Uh, it's kind of a dual example. Hearing for pay is not only an American phenomenon. Recently, while visiting China, I learned that the line standing business has become routine at top hospitals in Beijing. Okay, um, the market reforms of the last two decades have resulted in funding cuts for public hospitals and clinics, especially in rural areas. So patients from the countryside now journey to the major public hospitals in the capital, creating long lines in registration halls. They queue up overnight, sometimes for days, to get an appointment ticket to see a doctor. The appointment tickets are a bargain, about $2, but it isn't easy to get one. Okay, rather than camp out for days and nights in the queue, some patients desperate for an appointment buy tickets from scalpers. Okay, the scalpers hire people to line up for appointment tickets and then resell the tickets for hundreds of dollars, more than a typical peasant in China makes in months. Okay, so doctor appointments are another example. Okay, and actually in America, what we have here are increasingly uh, concierge doctors for the wealthy. Okay, you guys know how long it takes to get in to see uh, a general practitioner for an initial appointment. Sometimes it could take months. And the way that this has been solved using market-based reasoning, at least among the wealthy, is uh, concierge doctors, where the doctors charge you a flat fee each year. Maybe it's 1500 or 2000 and in return, they are much less busy and you can get in to see them basically the same day as soon as you have some sort of medical malady. Okay, so you get to trade time for money and in this case get in to see a medical practitioner more quickly than you otherwise would be able to do. Let's use these four examples. Jumping airport security lines in the fast, uh, fast track, express lanes, on highways, Shakespeare lines, and doctor appointments, all of which introduced capitalist market-based thinking into a, the general society to solve social coordination problems that otherwise would not have been easily solvable. Let's use these examples to talk about some of the strengths, the moral strengths that is, and some of the moral weaknesses of markets. So strengths and weaknesses. This is just a general purpose exploration here, as we talk about these strengths and weaknesses, of the things that capitalist markets do well, morally speaking, and the things that they do poorly, morally speaking. Okay, so let's start with the strengths. Uh, from a moral point of view, what are some of the strengths of having express lanes or fast tracks in airport security lines or, um, or Shakespeare lines that are um, doled out on the basis of, of who's willing to pay for line standards or doctor appointments, uh, ticket scalpers. What are some of the moral strengths? You can think about this for a minute. What gets accomplished by virtue of these things? Kristen. Good. Okay, so um, certainly, I'm not sure if it's a moral strength, but I'll just list it up here. Certainly buyers and sellers. In this case, for instance, let's take Shakespeare. The um, buyers of the line standers, certainly they deem it worth their money to pay somebody to stand in line on their behalf. And the sellers, those who are willing to stand in lines, they gain by virtue of making money, which presumably is better than their alternative opportunities. So buyers and sellers benefit, and what we might say is that efficiency gains are made for the society. Let's think this through for just a minute. Generally speaking, market-based solutions to social coordination problems are much more efficient than other ways of doing things or ways of organizing the society or dividing people up. The reason why is because market-based solutions empower people as individuals to make whatever decisions they consider to be in their best interests. Okay, if it is a market-based arrangement where people can buy and sell freely without external intervention or regulation, then presumably, I think this is mostly the case, they will make decisions on the basis of what they perceive to be 
most beneficial to them. And when a whole bunch of different people do this, efficiency gains are made in the society as a whole. So for those for whom it makes sense to skip through lines quickly at airport security, they can purchase the opportunity to skip through the line quickly. That's an efficiency gain for the society. And presumably the airport security people can use the money that is made from that for improvements in whatever, you know, things they're doing. Okay, and similarly for these other kinds of services. So efficiency gains are definitely a major strength of um, markets. Okay, free markets allow people to make mutually advantageous trades and so they allocate goods to those who value them most highly, at least most of the time, as measured by their willingness to pay. Okay, one more time, when goods are allocated to those who value them most highly, the society as a whole gets efficiency gains. Okay, let's talk about other strengths, other strengths of this. Think with me for a second. Strengths of market-based solutions to these social coordination problems. What are other strengths? Three of them is helping pay for. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, so um, for this one, it helps pay. Uh, for the express lines, it pays for the roads, airport, for security, the salaries. Oh, yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah, the Shakespeare isn't going direct to the Shakespeare because they're giving away for free. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, um, but yeah, these other things are paid for. So the, uh, the low cost option is made possible by virtue of the high cost option. We might say at least in some of these cases, because the express lanes, presumably the highway is improved by virtue of the money that's made from the express lanes. The doctor practice is able to devote some of its time to uh, people who can't pay much by virtue of the fact that the people who can pay much uh, give the doctor the money to make the practice more efficient that way. Okay, so yeah, um, maybe uh, it provides low-cost options. And that in itself is a kind of an efficiency gain. I actually wasn't thinking of that, but that's an excellent point. Okay, the one I was thinking of was um, it maximizes liberty or freedom, right? So uh, when Market, I guess you guys can't see this back here. All right, let me just put it up here. When markets are used to solve social coordination problems, what happens is people are able to make free choices in ways that they would not be able to do if some central authority were trying to solve the social coordination problem by, you know, through coercion or some other means, compelling these people to go in this lane and those people to go in that lane or these people to uh, travel at this speed through the line and those people to travel at that speed. Okay, the, the freedom of individuals gets maximized when it is the individual who is making the choice and not some sort of authority making the choice on their behalf. Okay, and Sandel actually mentions this. He says, um, an argument in favor of market reasoning to solve social coordination problems is a libertarian argument. Uh, this argument maintains that people should be free to buy and sell whatever they please as long as they don't violate anyone's rights. Okay, uh, libertarians oppose laws against ticket scalping Okay, just like they oppose laws against prostitution or against the sale of human organs, they believe such laws violate individual liberty by interfering with the choices made by consenting adults. Okay, so that's another strength of markets from a moral perspective. At least I think most of us would consider that a strength. Uh, it maximizes freedom. Let's move over here to the weaknesses column and let's talk a little bit about the moral weaknesses and maybe a useful way to uh, think of, to conceive of the moral weaknesses is to think about it in terms of who doesn't benefit. Other people who can't pay for it. Absolutely, yeah, the people who can't pay. Okay. So uh, although it does, it is true that these uh, the high cost options provide low cost options in some cases. The poor people still can't take advantage of the faster lines. 
in these kinds of cases. So um, poor people lose out or hurts the poor might be a way of saying this. If you don't have the means to pay, markets generally are not the best solution for you to get positional advantages in the society. Okay, um, and actually that, that goes more generally for markets. Um, if you look back at a time in capitalism's history when it was a kind of a, a purer form of capitalism prior to extensive government regulation like we've got these days, in the early 19th century, for instance, in, in the UK, uh, they had a, a society where wealth was very stratified, uh, stratified. The wealthy were very wealthy and the poor were very poor. Okay, if you read the novels of Charles Dickens, for example, he talks extensively about uh, the problems with uh, city impoverishment at the time or, or um, industrial factories where the poor people were really abused. Okay, and in general, markets tend to, if left unregulated, make the wealthy very wealthy and the poor very poor, and the poor can't use markets to their advantage to obtain um, promising consumer goods because they tend to uh, not have the means to pay for those things. If you actually look at pure unfettered markets, some people, maybe they start out wealthy, they tend to become wealthier and other people, maybe those people start out poorer but not all that poor, they tend to become poorer by virtue of the operations of the market. The wealthy become wealthier uh, because sometimes they do so through good choices, they save or they um, come up with innovative products that uh, transfer wealth to themselves. Okay, others become poorer by virtue of markets because maybe they don't uh, save for a rainy day, they foolishly spend all their money, or maybe they have addictions that cause them to spend money on things that don't actually benefit them or their life position. Okay, and it actually requires external intervention to bring about greater equality in the society. Most of the time in capitalist societies that external intervention comes outside of the market in the form of taxation, coercive taxation. Taxation redistributes wealth for the most part from the wealthy to the poor. Okay, and it brings about some greater equity that way. Okay, uh, but the market mechanism itself generally is seen as having as one of its weaknesses the harm to the impoverished that comes about as a result of that. Okay, um, and let me illustrate that for just a second. Okay, when I was a kid, uh, I was a really big Texas Rangers fan. Um, I still follow the Rangers, but... Um, Heartbreaking, isn't it? Oh, I know, yeah. It's, it's tough. <laughs> I still follow the Rangers, but when I was a little kid, I was a huge fan. I had the day-to-day -day batting averages of the starting lineup memorized, and I knew all the pitchers' day-to-day -day ERAs and everything. Right? I was a big fan. Okay, I was nine years old or so. And um, my dad, I grew up in Fort Worth, and my dad would sometimes take me to the Rangers games. Okay, now my dad's not really a baseball fan, but he was nice, an uh, indulgent father, and he'd take me to the Rangers games. Do you guys know where we sat, though? In the Nosebleeds. Third deck outfield, okay? Oh, yeah. Couldn't see a thing, right? Bought the binoculars. There's nine-year-old me trying to see through the binoculars. Um, this was back in another era. You guys will see how old I am when I tell you that uh, I got to watch big stars like Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire come in and play against the Rangers. The Rangers were, uh, they had their own stars too. Uh, Juan Gonzalez, Rafael Palmero, Bud Rodriguez, big stars when I was growing up. Um, at any rate, though, now, at the games, there would be a lot of people who were sitting much closer to the action than I was. People sitting along the first baseline, the third baseline, people who were really, you know, willing to pay higher price tickets and, uh, and get closer to the action. Now, let me ask you, there's nine-year-old me who's got the batting averages memorized and the ERA mem ERA's A's memorized and like this huge fan. And then there are the people along the first and third base lines. Now the way the market mechanism has divided up the seats 
is by giving those people the seats that are close to the action and me the seats in the outfield. Did the market mechanism actually allocate the seats at the Rangers game to the people? Did it give the best seats to the people who most wanted to see the action? Or did it give the best seats to people on some other criteria? Are you in the middle of the most? Right. Excellent. Yeah. It gave the seats to the people who wanted to pay the most and had the means to do so. That's the key qualification. Absolutely right. People who actually had the means to pay the most. So one argument against markets from a moral perspective is that they are actually not always very good at providing the people who most want a product with the ability to bring that desire to realization. You may really, really, really want to get to your plane quickly, but if you don't have the means to pay for one of those express lanes, you can't do it. Here are the highway or doctor appointments. Maybe you really, really want a kidney, but you can't get there fast enough because you have to take this slow six month wait line or something like that and can't expedite your appointments by virtue of paying for faster services because you lack money. Okay, so the criticism then is that the poor people lose out and sometimes markets aren't very good at connecting up desire for a product with obtaining the product, with the realization of that goal. However, markets are much better than basically everything else that we've come up with as humans for allocating those kinds of, of resources. Okay, let me say that one more time. I'm, I'm simply expressing here the imperfection of markets. I'm highlighting the ways in which markets don't always perfectly uh, connect up the people who have the greatest desire with the good in question. Okay, but I am not saying that markets are inferior to some other system. If you look at other systems, like some central authority distributing the seats, they tend to be much, much less efficient than markets because although there is not perfect correlation between desire and product that you desire, because there is the medium, the intermediary qualifying factor of the people who have the ability to pay being able to obtain the product, still it is a much closer correlation than what humans are usually able otherwise to achieve in other kinds of distribution systems. If you look, for instance, at socialist countries like Venezuela or Cuba, they have all these long, long lines. Okay, long lines for everything. For uh, medical services, long lines for tire changes, long lines for, uh, we have long lines at the DMV, but they have long lines for absolutely everything. Okay, um, the reason why is because they're trying to centrally distribute the resources. Okay, when we, whenever we try to centrally distribute the resources without giving the people who are willing to pay the opportunity to go faster, we get an inefficient system like the long lines at the DMV. That's basically what happens. Scarce good, no, but no market mechanism to enable people to sort themselves out on the basis of who can pay for that scarce good. Okay, more people lose out. Let's look at other weaknesses. Or let me ask you guys, are there other weaknesses? I'm looking for a couple of others here. Other weaknesses of a market-based solution to um, social coordination problems. Here's one. Arguably, a market-based solution corrupts the goods that are being bought and sold. Okay, when money is brought in, a lot of people say, well, money cheapens the good. For instance, think of Shakespeare for a second. Why do you think the people who run the Shakespeare Festival want to give the tickets away for free? They want people that really want to go to the event. Go to the event. Yeah, I think that they think that Shakespeare should be available for everybody. And if the poor people want to go see Shakespeare, they should be able to see Shakespeare and we shouldn't, you know, charge a fortune and only let the elites go to see Shakespeare, right? I mean, you're charging time, not cost. Absolutely. And poor people's time is less valuable 
the wealthy people's time. And so actually charging for the Shakespeare tickets in terms of time rather than cost, so that people queue up for it, it switches the favoritism and it actually enables poor people to get a leg up on the wealthy people because poor people are more willing to pay in time than wealthy people are willing to do. Wealthy people tend to be very averse to paying in time. Okay, um, but arguably Shakespeare gets corrupted when people buy and sell Shakespeare. Okay, so um, let me make this point as just corrupt resources or goods. Here's, here's an illustration. Let me let me make it uh, let me make the point another way. Okay, um, imagine you're looking at a you're dating somebody and it's a potential uh, marriage prospect. Like this is serious dating, right? Potential marriage prospect. And um, as you get into this relationship, you realize this person's got a lot of flaws. I mean, if you're imagining a future life with this person, you realize this person is gonna this person's going to be decent as a spouse, but not especially good. Okay, maybe maybe this person won't ever cheat on you, but there's going to be a lot of dirty laundry around the house, and there's going to be um, oh I don't know. This person's going to be late everywhere, right? People who aren't on time are often annoying. This person's going to be late everywhere, pretty lazy, right? And, and probably no intimate uh, emotional connection to this person. It's just kind of somebody you live alongside. But again, not going to cheat on you. Literally roommates. Yeah, just, you know, roommates. But not going to cheat on you. And, and again, like not some sort of, you know, um, like a disagreeable person. Just not somebody you're going to have a, a, a close, you know, deep lifelong relationship with. Okay. I, and you think to yourself, you know, Probably not. That's the thought that you got in your mind, okay? But then you find out in the course of this dating relationship that this person has a wealthy uncle who has just died and has left this person money. And you don't know quite yet how much money it's going to be, but you know it's going to be a lot, a lot of money. Let me ask you what the threshold number would be that you, at which you would agree to marry this person. So would you do it for a million dollars if this person's wealthy uncle was leaving this person a million dollars? No. Not for a million dollars, you guys would hold out. What, what about three million? For three million dollars, again, not gonna cheat on you, gonna be roommates mostly, not really a deep emotional connection or anything. Three million dollars. What about ten? Oh, there we go. That's it. Ten million dollars? You do it for ten? Yeah, that's a hundred thousand dollars for fifty years if you split it both ways. That's a lot. Yeah. A I mean, you're set for life. You're never working in your life. Yeah. If you do it right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Kristen, would you do it for ten? Um, you're like, no, nah, I'm gonna marry somebody who's gonna be like a deep romantic partner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this, but uh, I, know, I know the background here, so. Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to imagine doing it like, if you're not in a really, really happy relationship. Like, even though you get so much money, you can kind of be like. What about 40 million? <laughs> For 40 million? <laughs> No, let's say let's say that uh, let's say that that's part of the condition is you got to stay married. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. Married for science. A hundred million? Yeah, I mean, I don't have to see her. We can get a big enough house where I don't have to see her. Once you once you get enough money, I mean, you can have multiple houses. There's there's that. I guess the point is, the point is we probably all have a price, if we're perfectly honest. And again, I'm not talking about somebody who's going to cheat on you. We probably all have a price for where we're willing to settle and go with a decent person. Okay? Um, and yet, this exercise makes us all feel icky, doesn't it? Because marriage shouldn't be the sort of thing that we should buy and sell, right? It's the sort of, you know, 
probably most of us think that. I think that too. Um, why does it make us feel icky? Why do we think marriage shouldn't be something that should be bought and sold? Why should it be beyond price? Wouldn't market norms actually make marriage allocation more efficient? We were to introduce just buying and selling. I mean, you could, you could marry me for $2 million or something like that, and you advertise online. They used to advertise in catalogs. I guess now we could advertise online. And everybody just has a profile, and you just, you know, line up and buy and sell like you would in a retail establishment. Why would most of us find that horrible? What is it about marriage that makes us think it should be beyond price? It's supposed to be a connection between two people, not just money. Yeah, okay. It's supposed to embody some sort of a connection that can't be reduced to or expressed in mere well, financial terms. Worse. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. So arguably, marriage gets corrupted when you introduce market norms to into it. Okay. Arguably, marriage gets corrupted by that. Um, I could give you guys other examples. Uh, so for instance, how about this? Um, suppose you could sell your kidney for. Two hundred thousand dollars. I've got two of them, but I'm probably only done it right now. You don't need two kidneys. You don't need one. Just need one. That's uh, all right now. Two hundred thousand dollars. You can wipe out all that student debt, right? Those of you who don't have student debt, you could get a great start in life. Two hundred thousand dollars. Again, probably most of us feel a bit icky about that. And if you don't feel icky about selling human organs, you surely do about selling human beings. So what if we said, let's make the adoption market more efficient by buying and selling children? Okay, but then it would be saturated. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> it would probably be wildly popular, and probably also at the same time, everybody would, pe would feel... Uh, wildly taken advantage of. Yeah. But, but people got <laughs> well, I think that's true, too. Um, again, those are illustrations of ways in which people, most of us at least, feel as though market norms corrupt the goods in question. Um, Sandel highlights a couple of examples of ways in which uh, w there are certain goods that most of us think have value in ways that go beyond the utility that they give to individual buyers and sellers. Let me offer you two examples here. Okay, um, one example comes from the world of camping and national parks. So Yosemite National Park in California, Sindel writes, attracts more than 4 million visitors a year. About 900 of its prime campsites can be reserved in advance at a nominal cost of $20 per night. Okay, but it's not easy to get a reservation. Demand is so intense, especially for the summer, that the campsites are fully booked within minutes of becoming available. In 2011, however, it was reported in the, in, in the press that ticket scalpers were offering Yosemite campsites for sale on Craigslist for $100 to $150 a night. The National Park Service, which prohibits the resale of reservations, was flooded with complaints about the scalpers and tried to prevent the illicit trade. Okay, um, newspapers ran headlines saying things like, scalpers strike at Yot Yosemite Park is nothing sacred. Uh, the wonders of Yosemite belong to all of us, the editorial in the newspaper stated, not just those who can afford to fork over extra cash to a scalper. Okay, so that's an example of something that maybe most of us think would be corrupted by virtue of market norms. Um, the wonders of nature, which ought to be available to everybody. Or here's one last example of that. So Sindel writes, here's another example of market values colliding with a sacred good. When Pope Benedict XVI made his first visit to the United States, demand for tickets to his stadium masses in New York City and Washington, D.C. far exceeded the supply of seats. Free tickets were distributed through Catholic dioceses and local parishes. When the inevitable ticket scalping ensued, one ticket sold online for more than $200, church officials condemned it on the grounds that access to a religious right should not be bought and sold. There shouldn't be a market in tickets, a church spokeswoman said. You can't pay to celebrate a sacrament. <laughs> okay. Well, apparently you can. Um, but maybe you shouldn't, and that's the question that Sindel wants to offer us. 
Okay, so um, maybe papal masses or Yosemite Park sites get corrupted by virtue of market norms. Maybe they don't. Uh, but most people would perceive that as a moral weakness of markets. In summary, markets are excellent at bringing about more efficient allocations of resources. They're also really good at maximizing freedom and making that which would otherwise be uh, unavailable available. But markets are not very good at fairly or equitably distributing resources since they tend to favor the wealthy. And arguably also they have a corrupting effect when the market-based utility norm where buyers and sellers are benefited comes into conflict with goods that we consider to be sacred or beyond price. Okay, so those are just some examples here. Any questions or comments about this? Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for um, your regular attendance this semester. I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been the most challenging semester that I've ever experienced. I've been teaching for over 10 years now. So uh, we'll see what next semester holds. Uh, but we will continue to uh, finish the class online. And uh, I will try to get your papers back to you before Thanksgiving. So you can look for those in your email inboxes. If you do have any questions about the rest, the course, the rest of the semester, the fastest way to reach me is email. Okay. All right. Go in peace. You guys take care, and uh, I will see you next semester. <laughs>